Happy Tuesday. Kasia Lua, Kasia, Jonathan, Kisma, Alana, Aya, Tolo. I got a feeling. We have hands coming up in the queue already. Love it, love it, love it. Hello, Jessica from Oh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I was about to try and pronounce it in French. I'm really glad I saw the Idaho because then I didn't have to. Uh, welcome, everybody. Let's dive in and introduce our clicked coach for the day. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to the stage. Rebecca, if you don't know her, then give her a warm welcome. And if you do, do it anyways. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. <laughs> Want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have been in the Salesforce ecosystem for a few years now, probably going on six or seven. I don't really remember, to be honest. Um, and I've been through a few different roles in that time frame. So I came in originally through analytics and business intelligence, and then I swapped into business analyst roles and kind of like pseudo admin work as well. And then I moved up through to, you know, senior business analyst and solution architect briefly. So I played a few roles. I also um, started teaching during that time. So I've had the joy of bringing a lot of new admins and business analysts through into the Salesforce ecosystem and have done a fair amount of work to try and build up strong on-ramps for those who are just getting started. So excited to extend that work through Clicked. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and by a show of emojis, how many of you have been to a data loading session with us before? If you have been to a data loading session, if you'll give me a heart, and if you have not, some confetti. I'm curious to see the spread here. Okay, mostly new folks, which is awesome, awesome. We had like 200 signups for this one, so really looking forward to a discussion and um, participating in, in this learning with you all. Uh, we're going to go through our agenda now. We'll do a quick refresh on what we are all about here at Clicked. What is the experience? What is the scenario? What is the task? Then we will discuss the topic. We'll discuss the topic for uh, about 20 minutes or until hands are raised, whichever one comes first. We have actually already have a hand in the queue, which is awesome. So we'll do a little bit of a discussion and then move into live feedback. And this is where you get to share your work. You get to come on stage by raising your hand, present your work, or if you've got a question that you want to have a back and forth discussion on, you can also raise your hand for live questions. And then we'll move into Q&A and discussion at the end. This is what you will experience in the session today. Uh, Co-created learning, we learn from each other here. Whatever you share is going to help all of us collectively learn and um, asking, asking your questions and participating. And of course, it is a safe space to try. Uh, I think I've heard this and definitely experienced it myself. Rebecca, I'm sure you can agree. Uh, no data load goes without a hiccup. <laughs> that like it's it's going to happen unless you've got the cleanest data in the world so it's a safe space to try not get it perfect on the first time and of course have fun every single one of these sessions is different and that is because all of you are different and we have different moods and different thoughts and different insights every time how do i interact in this session well of course the skills challenges are here for you to present your work and you do that by raising your hand and getting live feedback you can also use the chat uh, many of you are saying hello in the chat hi hilda with your signature gif love it and uh, many other familiar faces as well so you have successfully found the chat Huzzah. And then we've got the Q&A box, which is directly below that. Uh, that's where I would request that you put your questions that you have. And the reason why is because sometimes the chat can get a little bit noisy or a little bit busy. And uh, the Q&A will allow me to see all of the questions that you ask in session and bring those up at the end so that we don't miss anything. And yep, as I mentioned before, you can also ask live questions. So with that, everybody, Let's go into the scenario and the task. As always, scenarios and tasks are available in the clicked experience page, which is the place that you signed up for the experience in uh, 72 hours before the session begins. So you always have the opportunity to work through it. 
but if you have not already, then you can go ahead and work through it now. And we'll give you some time to do that before sharing the scenario. Y'all know Dreamforce is coming up. Anybody uh, going to be attending Dreamforce this year? <clears throat> I went last year, but will not be attending this year. No? Nobody? All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> we will live vicariously then. You've been hired to come in as a Salesforce admin for Dreamforce. The digital engagement team needs your help with contact and campaign management so that their new org is ready to retrieve the data from the mobile app and the team can start creating campaigns that will, I lost my place, that will continue to engage the attendees all the way until the next Dreamforce. You'll be working with Davina Grohl, head of digital engagement to complete this project. Everyone, I'm gonna be sharing the data set here, just pinned in the channel. This is the information that you are going to need in order to complete this task. So once you open that up, please go ahead and make a copy. I will not be granting editing access as this is a public document. So make a copy and begin your work. This is the task. Uh, you can review the interview information, which is in the clicked experience page. Um, make sure you have made a copy of the data, then set up your Salesforce org. Um, if this is your first time or if you're new to Salesforce, just type in create developer org Salesforce into Google, and it'll take you right to a page that will allow you to spin up a dev org that you can use to upload the data. First thing you're going to want to do, though, is look through it, note any missing, incorrect data, or mm, things that you might want to consider before putting the information into a client's database. Only upload the data that has a designated company into Salesforce as a contact and create a brief note or one to do slide presentation describing the work you're able to do highlighting any remaining questions that you have. This can be a Word doc, this can be a slide presentation. You don't have to make it beautiful. Um, it's just gonna be there for what were you able to do, what did you find, and if you've got any questions. You'll know you're done when you've scanned and noted any incorrect data in the spreadsheet, you've uploaded it, and created a brief note summarizing the status, include specifics about ready, missing, or incorrect data, and then you've got questions that you can ask. So with that, let's go ahead and move into our coach discussion. First things first, let's define what is data loading? Why does it matter? Why do we do it? And is it different in Salesforce than maybe other places that we may have seen it? Yeah, good question. So data loading is essentially trying to take any information that you already have somewhere else and put it into Salesforce. So really easy example, maybe you're switching into Salesforce from another system or from a non-system perspective where you've been on spreadsheets this whole time, whatever the case may be. You have all that information from the last five years or so that you were capturing on spreadsheets. No, you weren't capturing it in Salesforce, but you were capturing it somewhere. So our mission is to not make you start from scratch. We want to include all of that good data, all of that information that you've so painstakingly captured this whole time. Um, so we're going to take it from our Excel sheet or wherever it lives, and we're going to try to load it into Salesforce so that you're not starting with a blank canvas. You are starting with some of the history that you've accumulated over the years. Awesome. Wonderful explanation. I'm going to make a, a snapshot of that. Um, and, and when we load it in, is there a specific format that we need uh, or can we just, you know, pop it in? <clears throat> Yeah, so um, Salesforce allows particular formatting in terms of like the document that you're bringing in, right? So for example, CSV. Um, the other item once you get in there is that you are taking information in a column and you're loading it into a Salesforce field. So whatever information is in that column needs to be in an acceptable format and meet the rules for the field that you're bringing it into. And that includes, you know, if it's required, then you shouldn't have empty values in that column. Um, if it's, you know, a numbers only field and you have text in that column in your source data, that's not good. We need to go through, clean that out um, and either fill in data that's missing or 
you know, maybe massage data to fit our anticipated way forwards. And sometimes that may be more intensive than others. Like you may have um, information that's going to be like fundamentally changing. For instance, maybe this is kind of an easy one, but maybe when you previously did male or female or gender in general, right? Maybe previously you had M or F and now going into Salesforce, it's going to be male, female, um, prefer not to specify or, you know, some kind of like fourth, third, fourth option. Um, all those things have to be decided beforehand, first of all. So you need to know what all the options are going to be in Salesforce. And then when you're bringing information over, you need to map your previous data to one of the new options, right? And there's some that, that are going to be a little bit wonky, right? If you only had male, female before, like particularly if you're thinking about, you know, maybe even just like government information centers, a lot of government data previously would have said male, female only, right? And now if you're going to start including options for, you know, non-binary or something like that, you're going to have responses previously that said male or female that actually should have said non-binary, but it wasn't an option at the time, right? So there's a lot of levels to cleaning. There's kind of the obvious stuff of, you know, do the restrictions match up? There's going to be, again, obvious stuff of is it blank when it shouldn't be? Um, And then you're going to get into some more like nitty gritty stuff that you're going to have to probably make a habit of updating over time. So for instance, in the case that I just talked about, it's something where maybe, you know, the customer service rep would prompt as you're going through like, oh, this is the information we have on file for you. Is this correct? Or would you like to make any changes? And at that point, somebody could update to one of the new options. Or if they had a portal of some kind and they logged in, then you might see a prompt that's like, oh, hey, you know, this is the information we have for you, the name, address, you know, all the other contact info. Can you confirm that these are correct? And again, at that point, you'd be able to make changes to a new or updated option. So yeah, there's different levels to it, but we're going to start. We're going to start from the beginning today. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, starting from the beginning is excellent. And, and you know, you, when you're talking about field mapping, I had a couple other things come up. So, you know, you talk about formatting and, and field type. So what if, you know, for example, we've got this data set over here, previous sponsor, true or false, but what if the, you know, the, the field in Salesforce is a pick list? Does that mean I have to format the spreadsheet ahead of time to be like the exact same type? What happens if I do it wrong? What if there's an extra field in the spreadsheet that doesn't exist in the object? Like, what 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 do we do there? Yeah, so an extra field that doesn't exist, you need to go back to the stakeholders and make sure that that information should live in Salesforce. Because either you are looking at two different field names, essentially. So, like, maybe one says ID, and in Salesforce it says legacy, meaning legacy ID. Um that could happen where the, the information is the same, but the labels are different. Or you could just not have a place for that yet in Salesforce. Maybe no one specified that that information needed to be captured in Salesforce, but now we do. So we've got to go back to the stakeholder and just confirm that we should make the new field, right? Um, but one way or another, you're going to have to find a way to get that info into Salesforce if it needs to be there. So it's probably going to be a new field. Um, But I would, again, just double check first to make sure that you're not creating a new field that you actually don't need and the labels are just different. Um, And then in terms of massaging data that does exist, but needs to maybe be a little bit different with the pick list example. um, So there's a couple layers, actually, the (laughs) true or false. Salesforce will accept several different options. I believe it's true, false, one, zero, and yes, no. I could be wrong about that. Double check. Um, But it will accept and kind of equate multiple like binary true, false um, options into its preferred format. So that's okay. But if we're at, you know, something totally different, like let's say we did red, green, right? Green means go. That means yes. Um, In that case, we need to map in Excel or whatever tool we're using 
to do this um, data cleaning, we need to map it to the new response options in Salesforce. So we would go through and we would say, okay, find in this spreadsheet every instance of green. And hopefully green is only available in that column because if not, we're going to have to manually go through and do some stuff. But, <laughs> but if it's only available in that column, we can say go find every instance of the word green and change it to true. And then go find every instance of the word red, change it to false. And then we're good to go, right? So we do some, some semi-manual um, massaging as we're going through this process. If we have data that needs to be cleaned to change the formatting, um, to check for duplication, to check for errors, to check for all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> Yep, duplicates are fun. I'm sure we'll discuss more about that later on in the session. But uh, for now, we're actually going to bring up our first presenter. It looks like Jonathan will be coming to the stage. So can everyone please drop some emojis for Jonathan? Excited to see what you've got today. And anyone else, if, if you have work that you want to share, you can you can start raising your hands now so that I know. Okay, <clears throat> awesome. So, uh, hello, Coach Rebecca and Rachel. So, here's my, um, I put it like my screenshots in a PowerPoint. I've seen other people do that and they really impressed me. So, I thought, okay, they raised the bar. Um, so, basically, I started off with the data that I downloaded, and um, I have one assumption is that you know previous sponsor status was something that was already discussed and they had already decided that this is something they needed to have in their org and i was so i just kind of went ahead and i made that assumption that this was already dealt with okay so we started off with uh 829 rows 64 were missing the company name and they had specifically said that these needed to be removed 87 um, rows had a missing value for previous sponsor status. So that left like theoretically 678 that were ready for, for upload. Um, zero rows were missing a first name, last name, which was a, which is required for contact. And um, none of them were missing email. To me, like, if it didn't have an email, I didn't see the point of uploading it. How are you going to contact this person? Um, I used a regular expression to verify that all the email addresses were good, and they all were. And I used a count if formula to check if there were any duplicate emails. There were not. Okay, so going to the next, um, I assumed a discussion took place between myself and the stakeholder. And I said, well, what do you want to do with those uh, rows where there's no value for um, previous sponsor status? And she said, well, assume they're false. So I gave all those an answer of false. And then it was like, well, for the account records, who exactly is the owner of that, right? um our contacts assigned oh sorry no our contacts assigned to the owner so basically there if you own the account you own the contact that was you know a question because it's not a, a master detail to look up and then the last one like who exactly is going to own these new accounts and she's said well assign it to john barry he's the sales manager and he'll decide who's going to work on it so I created this user, made him the sales manager, and retrieved his, um, 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 you know, ID using dataloader.ao. Um, okay, so here were the steps. First, I baked, backed up the CSV file because if some, you know, that's the original data, right? So I didn't want to lose that. So I just made a copy, put the copy to the side. Then uh, I removed the rows with no company. I made all the rows that had uh, nothing for previous sponsor status false. Okay, so that was the preparation of the data basically. Uh, then I backed up the data that was in uh, Salesforce and 
to me, um, I wasn't sure if I should back up everything, but since we were only going to be touching user account and contact, I just downloaded those uh, from dataloader.io. Um, and then had to kind of pay attention to the order that uh, we were uploading things, right? So contact is the parent. I mean, account is the parent of contact. So, you know, the parents come before the children. And um, for um, an account, well, basically the mandatory fields are account name, which the spreadsheet gave us, but and account owner, right? Which that's why I created John Barry before. And so there were two columns, name, lookup user. I tested it with a small batch of five. Everything was good. So then I uploaded the rest and I didn't do those five twice. And um, it returned 321, um, like on this page right here, it's kind of small, but you see at the bottom, records process 321. And if you did a count if on the um, unique for, um, on the spread on the CSV file for uh, unique accounts, it was the same number. So to me, that was good, right? So um, then once the accounts were loaded, uh, I downloaded using data loader, their record IDs, and those were added to the, um, um, the contacts because the contacts have to belong to an account. And that was their, you know, the record IDs. And then I repeated the same steps, tested a batch of five. Those were good. Um, I also made sure there were no duplicates for the email addresses. Um, there were none. And I got, um, well, this is me in D data loader. And uh, here's the 765 records processed success. And that's the end. Very nice. All right, I wanna go back to that screen before your first success slide. Okay, hold on. Um, give me one second here. The first success slide, okay, right here? Yeah, so uh, da, 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 da. Uh, let's go to analysis of data actually. This one? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so you went through a good process here when you looked at analyzing this data, you said, okay missing a company name we're gonna get rid of those pull them out right because we don't know who they belong to we don't really know anything that is an interesting one um potentially well i guess let me ask what did you do with those records or what would you do with those records well the original i actually thought about that and i was like well they never said like don't keep the data mm -hmm. right so step one here, backup of CSV file. That was before any manipulation because mm -hmm. we, I don't know if they want that data later, right? So it's like, I, I made sure like before I make any changes, there's a backup because maybe later, right? They figure out a way to, um, to use that information. So that, that's my answer to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think backing up the data is crucial. I really appreciated that you pointed that out. And it's interesting that you noted that you backed up the CSV as well as the Salesforce sources. So you didn't back up only one source, you backed up every source of data that you were working with at the time, which is honestly smart. <laughs> um, because I've definitely been in the situation where I minorly, maybe possibly sort of corrupted my CSV data. And that was kind of annoying for me. Luckily, I had been sent the CSV from somebody else. So I could go like pull it back out of my email or whatever. Um, but depending on what source you're working with, that may or may not be easy to do. <laughs> it may not be available still. So yeah, definitely keeping a solid backup of all of your data that you are not going to touch and manipulate is a fabulous habit to get into. Um, with regard to the missing company name stuff, what I would typically see done with those 64 rows is they would get sent back. 
Um, and either I could manually cross-reference them with a different data source that I had. I say manually, it's not as manual per se. Um, but let's say I have one Excel of all of our contacts coming from, you know, the sales lead. I also have, let's say, some HubSpot data, right? It may be that my company name is not in the Excel, but it is in HubSpot or vice versa. So first step, I would cross-reference with any other available data that I have. If I don't get hits on that, then what I'm typically going to do is I'll go through and do a doesn't make sense check and say, okay, are there some rows in here that are like John Doe? If that's the case, I'm going to, you know, assume that we can nix those ones. Um, but for the rest of them that look like they could be real people, if they are coming from a relatively personal source, um, so a sales rep has presumably talked to this person at some point, I would typically kick it back to the sales lead and say, hey, here's the data that we're missing. If you have the information, you can say, here's the sales rep it came from, or you can even talk directly to that sales rep. Um, but you're like, hey, here's what I've got that's missing data. Does anybody know the answer <laughs> to these questions, right? Like, hey, Jonathan, you've been working with Rachel, I see. Um, it doesn't say what her company is, and I'm kind of confused about this address over here. Do you have anything uh, to contribute on that? Like, is it something where maybe you know who she is, you know what company she is, and you may be like, look, man, I talked to Rachel once. It was two years ago. I don't remember that, <laughs> right? Like, that's not yeah. happening. Fair enough, fair enough. But on the other hand, if you can sit down and be like, oh, yeah, 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 Rachel, uh, I think I talked to her a few months ago at that conference. She worked for, um, uh, clicked, clicked. That's what it was. Then you can, you know, go fill out the rest of that record, and all of a sudden we have complete data. Yay! Um, so it doesn't always work that way, but particularly depending on your sales structure, you may find that like one customer or one contact is pretty impactful, right? We may have a relatively um, kind of low volume of customer business, but a high volume of sales within the customers we have. So mm -hmm. particularly if that is kind of your vibe as a company, you may find that 64 records is more than you want to really just kind of like toss <laughs> so yeah. every extra record that you can complete data on is a win you know what i'm saying yeah sure. um so yeah that's that's kind of my thought on that is i would typically save them off to the side put them in their own sheet um see if you can pull information for them and if you can't kick what you can't find back to somebody who is in sales and if they've had hands on they might be able to answer your questions However, if you know your company and you're looking at those 64 and you're like, yeah, these all came in from the web. There's no way anybody knows them. Like there's no information to contact them. It's not happening. Then maybe you, you know, kind of put it in your spreadsheet more or less to die. And you're like, hey, these ones are missing, but I have really no hope of like getting any info out of them. And you can breeze it by your stakeholders at some point if you'd like and basically be like, hey, I'm going to just kill these because... I got nothing for them. And they can be like, yeah, that's fine. Or if they don't freak out about it. They can be like, oh, you can't kill those. We might be able to make money on those people. And you can be like, all right, how do you wanna how do you wanna find the data for these? <laughs> um, but either way, I think that is like again, gives you a good opportunity. You don't run into the problem where your stakeholder is like, Ah, oh, but I gave you this information and then you didn't do anything with it and you didn't put it in and I, I expected all my data to be in the system and it's not. What happened? <laughs> um, so it's a good kind of um, habit to get into of save them off to the side, freeze them by the stakeholders. And then at that point, you can say, look, man, I dealt with all the data I had, you know, and if you can find other stuff for this, great. And if not, we can agree to put it to bed and that's fine with me. But either way, somebody else saw it. You gave them the opportunity. You did all you could do. Um, 87 rows missing for previous sponsor status. I really liked that you talked about this and you talked about how you came to a decision on, hey, 
we're going to decide that this defaults to false. So if there's no value, we're going to assume you didn't previously sponsor. I don't have another source of data to cross-reference against. If I'm missing it, I'm missing it. That's it. So I have to make a decision on what I'm going to put in, and this is it. Um, when you talk to a customer about this, right, because you typically aren't going to get all these up, up front. You're not usually going to get all these answers up front of like, well, what do I do in this case, in this case, in this case? Usually you're going to get through the data, and then you're going to look, and you're going to say, oh, hey, we're missing half of the responses in this particular column. Yeah. What do I do with that? Um, when you find yourself in that position, I strongly recommend that you put yourself in the customer's shoes, think through what the field is actually talking about, what it's actually doing, what it's trying to achieve, what action they're going to take based on that information, and at least come up with a proposal, right? So in your case, maybe you went to your stakeholder and you said, hey, I don't have this information. I don't have anywhere to cross-reference it from. I don't think I can get it. Um, I would like to, I think it makes sense to default it to false, right? Because then we aren't offering them, um, you know, additional services or additional attention that we shouldn't be giving them. Um, and if the answer is true and we speak to them and we find that out later on, we can always update it, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's good to come with a suggestion and reasoning for the suggestion. It doesn't have to be the one the stakeholder goes with. Maybe they're like, no, I'd rather treat it as true, give them the extra attention, send them the extra emails, and then if they didn't previously sponsor and they don't want those extra emails, they'll tell me. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think, you know, but, but always come with a suggestion because it's so overwhelming. I mean, you were prepared for this, right? you knew there was going to be a lot of data and you were going to have to clean it and it was going to take time and you were going to load it in and it was probably going to go bad. And, you know, it, it is what it is. It's okay. You were mentally prepared for that. Your stakeholder nine and a half times out of 10 is not going to be prepared for that. <laughs> They're not going to be prepared for records that are missing, that are half missing, that aren't in line with the Salesforce formatting, that this, that, the third, right? Their idea of this is they were like, oh, I have a ton of data. This is scary. I'm going to shove it all in a spreadsheet and I'm going to shove it at Jonathan and I'm going to cross my fingers, close my eyes and hope that nothing comes back. Please, Jonathan, <laughs> just get it all in there. No problems, please. <laughs> um, so I would say as much as you can minimize their distress or decisions in this time, they will generally appreciate that. Um, so if you can come in and be like, hey, I have these five problems. My proposed solutions are this for this. This is why. This for this. This is why. This for this. This is why. And these are some impacts. This is why. <laughs> you know what I mean? As much as you can just kind of like bang through them and really speak in human language, right? Like you want to hone in on the business why. You want to hone in on this is how I think it's going to impact our customer experience. This is what I think the impacts of the two options are. This is why I think this one is a better outcome for us, right? As much as you can talk to them about their customer, their experience, their daily life, what it's going to feel like, that is much better because most of the stakeholders you're dealing with that have the information are not systems-oriented people right? They're, they're out there to sell. They're out there to know their customer. They're out there to remember Rachel's birthday and her son's name and that he's doing travel basketball and that she's buying a house soon, right? That's a lot of stuff. They are not then also going to be an Excel spreadsheet in their own mind of errors and how to resolve them, right? <laughs> they're already doing the most. <laughs> um, so yeah, just as much as you can like keep your language reflective of the language that they would use themselves, of their lived experience, um, and try to keep data out of it as much as possible. I know that sounds weird for doing data work, uh, but it's usually the best. <laughs> so come um, with ideas, come with suggestions, come with reflective language, not your internal thought process of how you're going to do this. What, what, what would it be? normal to um discuss um what the data means before you even yeah. do this that's an excellent point so hopefully there's kind of two ways that this goes in my personal experience um if you are just like starting from the sheet right so you've 
you've never met this company before you don't know these people and they're like hey i want to retain you to do this data load right then you're going to go in and you are going to very specifically sit down for probably several hours and go through line by line what does this call mean what does this mean what does this mean what does this mean what does this mean um, and hopefully you have a really good idea of it by the end more likely you are doing this data load as part of your work as an admin or as part of a consulting engagement or something like that at that point you hopefully know this customer pretty well right so you know what their business process is you know who their customer is you know what they sell you know who sells it you know a lot of information about them at that point, my expectation would be that they would pass you a spreadsheet like this, and you would go through and take at least a first pass at what each of the columns means. Because you know their business process, so you know at least some of the information that they either are capturing or could be capturing. Um, and hopefully the column names are at least somewhat indicative. If we're lucky, it can go either way. <laughs> um, but hopefully <laughs> there's some info in there. Um, so at that point, I would take a first pass of what you think each of the columns is capturing. And I would literally write it down on paper and be like, I think this means this. I think this means this. Um, and then I would send that by the stakeholder and have a conversation and basically say, hey, I saw SLA. Based on my knowledge of our company and looking at the data that's in there and what it looks like, I think that this means service level agreement and i think that the acronyms or whatever is actually in this field stand for gold silver and bronze which are our sla tiers is that accurate right if you're lucky that's that's where you're at you're like oh, i saw a bunch of weird looking stuff but i know something about this company so i'm pretty sure that this means this and this means this um if you're not so lucky and you have no idea what the acronym could possibly mean, then yeah, you're going to have to just, you know, pop it up there and be like, hey, I'm pretty sure I know all the rest of these, but this one I'm pretty sure I don't know at all. So <laughs> can we just go through this and make sure that I know what this is, where it's used, who's using it, all that fun jazz. Um, and that's particularly important as you're going forward um, because you may or may not even have the fields available in Salesforce yet. So you may see a field that says SLA and you're like, oh, I don't know what it means, but it's probably fine. I'll just slam it into Salesforce and it'll be okay, right? And then you go over to Salesforce and there is no field that says SLA and you don't know what it means. And so now you're trying to create a new field for a thing that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And in creating the new field, you also need to decide where it's going to show up on page layouts, who should have access to it and who shouldn't, um, <laughs> and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So like now we're kind of at a point where it's like, oh, shoot, I really know, I need to know what that field means. And the trick there is that if you have out of shyness or, you know, a desire to, to not seem like you don't know what you're doing, if you've avoided asking the question, even though you didn't know what it was, and now you're kind of hitting the tail end of your data load, and now you go to upload it and realize you don't have the field there and need to make a new field and don't know anything about it, now it's like kind of late to ask, right? Now it's kind of mm -hmm. embarrassing to ask. <laughs> so ask all your questions early. Make sure that if you do see a field that you don't understand, and you have no hope of understanding it via context or what's in the field, make sure you ask early on because there is nothing as embarrassing as getting to the end and then being like, hey, what is this? And they're like, you've had weeks and you didn't, you never asked, you never, did you care to understand my business? Like, wait, I thought you did understand my business. Like, if you understand my business, how do you not know? And if you don't understand my business, how are we going to go live in three days and I'm going to be okay? Like, what's, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> so don't stress your stakeholders out, bite the bullet, ask early, make sure you know what's going on, know why it's used, know where it's used, know who uses it. Um, because particularly if you have to start creating fields later on, like it's pretty, it's not 
terrible, right? But it's a little bit intensive, particularly if it's going to be used and referenced widely. Like, you need to know where it lives and what it does. So, yeah, that was a lot of talking, but <laughs> that's my No, it's amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about... Oh, yeah, previous sponsor status. So the other thing that was really interesting to me with this, how did you think through the previous sponsor status? Because you put well, it in fact. Okay, well, I mean, it's binary, okay? Yeah. So the absence of saying yes is to me is like it's checked or unchecked, okay? Mm -hmm. So not putting anything is pretty much the same as saying unchecked. So really, you know, you're basically, look, if we're going to capture this information, right, just so you know, right, like, if I don't put anything here, it's unchecked. Right. right? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. My thought process is thinking about the business why. To you, we're working for Dreamforce, right? Yeah. And we're putting previous sponsor status on contact. What does that field tell me from a business perspective? What can I do with that information? Well, I mean, you're probably going to have a different uh, procedure for handling these contacts than the ones who didn't, right? Otherwise, the information's useless. The other thing is, is that, you know, um, unless somebody was really sloppy with record keeping, um, you probably know who your previous sponsors are. Okay, that's kind of like an important information to have, right? So, I mean, the people who are random, um, well, it's like, you know, you're not going to be, I've never seen you before, so you're not a sponsor. And if I don't even, to me, to me, logically, if I don't, like, it's kind of like, I don't know that guy over there. And it's like, well, I know he never, like, stuffed a $20 bill in my pocket. Okay, like this is true. I don't have that written down anywhere, but like I've never seen you before, so I'm pretty sure you never did that. Um, that's kind of like how I kind of looked at this, right? It's like common sense would tell you, unless there was a mistake, like a human mistake, if I don't know you, you weren't a sponsor, right? Like the chances of that just really are kind of like illogical. Yeah, you were here last year and you were one of the sponsors. And we all forgot your name type thing. Um, yeah, we are talking about many thousands of dollars in this context. So it is true that the odds of forgetting that are relatively low. Um, you yep. may have like many, many tiny sponsors. That might be a different vibe. Maybe you have yeah. $10,500 sponsors. Sure, sure. Um, but you make a good point that particularly with the data that you're looking at, it seems like the odds are relatively low. Um, the part, part of what I was trying to kind of angle at is how you decide what mm -hmm. counts as being a sponsor, because there is an interesting oh, okay. overlap here where if you think logically about what Dreamforce is like, you're not going to see Jonathan Lyles sponsored. If anything, you're going to see Jonathan Lyles cloud consulting company. Yeah, sponsored, that's true. Right. So it's interesting that we have that information at the contact level. So when you that see that in the data, your first question, at least from my perspective, would be, hey, is this actually specific to the person? Why are we capturing this at the Jonathan Lyles level? Is there a reason? And the answer may be, we needed to capture it somewhere it seemed good, right? And that might say, okay, let's have this conversation about whether or not it actually belongs here, because more likely it belongs with cloud consulting, right? Because realistically, that's probably who signed the check. And that's probably who's going to sign the check next year. Um, and you have another tricky wicket there, too, where you may say, OK, well, even though it was cloud computing who signed the check, Jonathan is the one who handles their sponsorship money. So if I want money again next year, I need to go ask Jonathan for it. Right. Which is a valid thought process. However, then we get into the sticky bit of like, well, what if Rachel takes Jonathan's job? What if Jonathan got promoted? He doesn't do sponsorships anymore. Rachel does sponsorships, right? Now we're reaching out to somebody who doesn't have the money for the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think there's definitely a strong argument to say that previous sponsor status actually belongs on account, which you could potentially make that swap. You said you were loading accounts anyway. So you could look at a data set and say, okay, even though my customer told me this was all contacts, I can see looking at it that like, eh, it's not all contacts. Oh, (laughs) they thought that was a peace sign. Very cute. Love the balloons. Um, yeah, did you do it on purpose? <laughs> no, it's it's just a thing that it does sometimes, but it's okay. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so you could make the argument and say, okay, even though they told me this belongs on contact, I'm going to highlight in a conversation with them that I'm going to switch it to account before I actually do it, right? So I'm going to I'm gonna sit down with my stakeholder. I'm going to say, okay, I've had a chance to look at all your data. I have questions about these rows. And also I saw this over here and I, it's... I know we're talking about contact data, but to me, this looks like it would live at the account level because I think it's about Jonathan's company more than Jonathan himself. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree with it. And you know what? So the mistake, right, which I I know what I did, I know what happened, is that I looked at it as I was given an order and who am I to question that order? So just do it, right? So, you know, you're telling me this belongs in account. Well... I'm not going to, I'm not going to contradict you. So I should be like maybe saying, Hey, does this really make sense to you? Because like, we all know that, right. It's the company doing the sponsoring, right? Yeah. Because well, there's, an, there's have- an argument for both, but yeah, I think this is awesome. Um, you had a really, really awesome start and I appreciate you letting me talk through all of the, <laughs> all of the ins and outs of these decisions. Cause I think it's, so interesting and it speaks so much to the challenges of data loading beyond just getting the data successfully into the system we also have to make sure it passes you know the does it make sense test and all the other tests that we're running on it so this was awesome thank you so much jonathan you did a fabulous job and i really liked your title slide just saying oh yeah okay (laughs) well thank you for the such long commentary um (laughs) i really got like the uh, vip service thank you so much Absolutely. Awesome. Yep. And thank, thanks for helping us or uh, allowing us to learn together. That was a very meaty discussion on data loading. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Jaya or Jaya. Uh, you are on the stage and currently muted, but you can unmute yourself and uh, share your screen. Maybe. Jaya, can you hear us? Jaya. Okay, I'm gonna remove you from the stage and I'm gonna pull you back on. Maybe that will work. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and pop in the chat, everybody, our feedback form. Uh, Let us know what you loved, what you learned. This is how we collect data from you as to uh, what is useful for you and what uh, what you would like to see more of. In the meantime, uh, we're gonna go ahead and show a couple of our Q and A's. Uh, Maria asks, what tools should usually be used for deep duplication? All right, I'm going to be straight up with you guys. <laughs> I'm sure there are tools for this. I'm sure there are AI tools for this. I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff. And I know for a fact that there are app exchange products and this and that everywhere. A lot of it is personal preference. A lot of it is what tools your company prefers to use. Um, and other than that, honestly, I use the standard standard functionality in Salesforce and Sheets or Excel. That's truly what I typically use. And I I just put in a function and say, go find all the stuff that matches. And that's it. It's very low tech for me. Huzzah, use Excel. And what yeah. about the remove duplicate rows function? Is that is that something that's recommended? I haven't. I mean, so I use stuff like that, but I I usually have it go through the single check, if I'm being honest. Like, usually there's an option where it's like, go automatically do it, black box, don't tell me about it. And then there's one that's like, oh, if you're particularly um, detail-oriented, shall we say, generously, then you can go through and check each individual one and decide if you want me to do that thing. I usually do that. It's It's terrible on thousands of rows. It really is. But that is honestly what I typically do because I'm so concerned about accidentally (laughs) deleting something I shouldn't. (laughs) 
don't trust don't trust the the built-in functions that's funny you and did. you used your stakeholder voice your stakeholder voice and your excel spreadsheet voice apparently so that that that's great uh jaya jaya can you hear us okay i can't hear you or yeah see hi you. Uh, can you hi. hear me now hi. Yes. yeah we can hear you hello yeah, yeah. hi rebecca and rachel yeah hi. so i'm just trying to share my screen it's somehow Yep, so you'll push the share screen and then select either the Chrome tab or the window that you want to share. Don't recommend sharing the entire screen. It uh, it typically does not work. Okay, yeah, so. so. Yeah, there's there's the square button. That's the, the magical one you'll want to look for. Oh uh, yeah, I'm started sharing my, uh, an app called, which I used Lucid. Can oh, nice. can you see that? No, I we cannot. Yeah. Oh, okay. What browser are you on? I'm on Edge. I'm on Mac. Edge it should be fine. Yeah, I'm on Edge, and uh, does it say loading, or does it show that it's? No, it's it's just say uh, the screen share works great. So your screen share is working. Hmm. hmm. Go ahead okay. and see if you can cancel it. Yeah, I'm going to gonna just stop scaring, uh, like stop sharing, and I'm just going to try one more time. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. And and while you bring that up, we talked about duplicates. Uh, Jonathan had used a couple of tools, the import wizard, the uploader, the uh, what is it, dataloader.io. How do you how do you decide which one which one to use? Yeah, so there's actually a comparison spreadsheet somewhere that <laughs> Salesforce, I believe, has put out. Um, basically, it comes down to like the number of rows and how intensive you intend to be in your data load, um, and also if you want to potentially load multiple objects at the same time. There are some circumstances, limited circumstances, in which you can do that. It also depends on what objects you want to load because not all methods support all objects. So you have to check that stuff. Um, there's also like some other tools that you potentially could use, again, really depending on what suite your company uses, but the most typical are Data Wizard um, and then Data Loader and dataloader.io, which are theoretically the same with some, some tweaks, some differences um, in their limitations. Cool. And um, someone had mentioned to me, or maybe it was in a previous skills challenge, there's a plugin that is new. I don't remember the name of it. It wasn't data loader. It wasn't data import. Was Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, it, it's like, it's a plugin. Data... I remember vaguely what you're talking about, but I don't remember the name of it. Oh, Sales yeah. Salesforce yeah. Inspector. Yes. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, so an inspector is used for a lot of things as well. It's not just data necessarily. Um, so it is like Salesforce Inspector is a really cool plugin tool if you want to just check it out and kind of pop around and see what it does. It, it actually is pretty robust. It, it does a lot. <laughs> it is fun. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the folks that I know that I admire that seem to work really quickly, they love Inspector. So it's probably a good tool to get to know. Okay, somehow it's um, because I was using lucid charts and uh, it's not, I don't know, it, I tried That's to okay. everything. That's um, okay. Were there parts that gave you trouble or parts that you had questions about? Yes. So uh, I understand the concept of uh, how we started even uh, Jonathan and told and in your intro to clean the data. And so I cleaned the data, you know, preparing by uh, deleting the blank fields. Specifically, you mentioned related to the designated company and the status. So there mm -hmm. were two things where the data was to be deleted. I think that was not required. So after cleaning up that, uh, so we, I removed the unnecessary values. There weren't many, but I removed the duplicate data. Even for the emails, there weren't any. 
uh, email duplicates, but I use the Excel formula to delete the, uh, you know, the duplicates and then avoiding typos and then using a clear format and uh, looking for any missing value and then uh, removing the unwanted outliers. So, so then uh, when my data was prepared, um, I imported the account, which is my, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of visualize, okay, I have two kind of set up of my data. One is the account and one is my user, which gonna go into, a, you know, when we finally will create a campaign, so it should go in there. So I separated the data sheet into two kind of things. One is like, one was my account details. So first name, last name, and my user would be, there was another set where I had to put in my email address. And so I didn't take up the status thing. I, I was confused there, is it necessary or not? The status part was, uh, you know, where it was true and false. That was, I couldn't fit in. So I still moved further and I created my accounts. So while in creating my accounts, first I like imported, uh, I used data wizard, like data import wizard. And then when I created my account, so I picked up the account ID from there mm -hmm. and, and then pasted back in my master sheet so that I know what's my account and their account IDs. And similarly, I used user and user IDs. So I wanted to link both of them. Like I was not getting how they are gonna know that this is my account and this is my user when we create campaigns. So yeah. I, so, so let's, I, let's I created the accounts, I created users, then I imported the lead as the campaign members, right? And um, so, but still, uh, even after, like, you know, when you create your org, you create your objects, and then you create your campaign field and email ID. And then I created the leads. I did create the page stating as my campaign object. And then there's an option where you can import your leads from there. So it came out to be 679 records. And, uh, but still I know I'm missing a major part where I'm not able to connect uh, my accounts with my users, though I have individually their IDs with me. So I'm not, because I'm a learner, I'm still a Salesforce new learner. And, for sure, uh, for sure. So, so what I would typically expect here is we're, we touched on actually kind of four objects, right? So, well, and I say objects, but we're, we're going to go with it. <laughs> so we have contacts, accounts, leads, and users, right? The information that you had was a little bit of information about the person and a little bit of information about the company. So you could have come and said, okay, I think this is actually a lead. I don't think it's a contact and account yet. I don't think we've sold to them. I don't think we know all the information about who they are that's required for contact and account. So I believe the information I'm looking at is a lead. That is a justifiable perspective, depending on the information you have. And you could go back to your stakeholders and say, hey, look, you know, we require X, Y, Z pieces of information about the company and about the person to say that, yes, this is an account and a contact. I don't have those pieces of information in this spreadsheet. So I know that you told me we want to load accounts and contacts, but I actually think this is lead data. Fair enough. Okay. We could do that. Alternatively, we say, okay, it does meet our business criteria for what an account and a lead are. And so the information we have is we have com company name and some information about the account account, which is the company, the organization. And we have some information about the person, right? Let's say Rachel, we have her first and last name, we have her email. Cool, great. We know something about her enough that we can contact her. So that would be a contact. So when I'm loading in, I'm going to load in the company information, right, which would be clicked. And then I'm going to export those IDs back out. And I'm going to match up the company name with the ID that I just got out of Salesforce. And then I'm going to attach that to my contact record for that particular contact that is attached to that account, that company. And then I'm going to load in my contact information and I'm going to say, okay, here's Rachel's info and here is the ID for clicked. 
go attach Rachel, create Rachel as a contact and attach her to clicked. And it will do that, right? Um, however, <laughs> unless you have an experience portal, right? So you have a you have a customer facing website, let's say like Home Depot, for instance, where you have a personal account and you can log into that website. Um, barring any anything like that, it's and even then really, but it, really Rachel's gonna be a contact rather than a user, right? She is a sponsor, she's interacted with me, she's paid me, but she's still a contact attached to an account rather than a user, which would be internal to my company and would have access to all of my Salesforce information, including my customer lists and all of that jazz, right? I even though Rachel has paid me, I don't need her to know the back end information on every sponsor I've ever had. That'd be a little weird for me. So sorry, Rachel, no dice for you. Um, so that's kind of what's going to keep her a contact is that I do not employ Rachel and she shouldn't have access to all of my information. She shouldn't be able to add new people. She shouldn't be able to do all of the things that you can do when you have Salesforce access to my instance. So she would be at one point a lead when I don't know enough about her to make her a contact. And then as we transition and we learn more, I would say, okay, account is clicked, which is the company and contact is Rachel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so fireworks. It, Was that yeah, helpful? So, so it should have been uh, first creating your uh, users and roles and and right. Then... So you so you would have users like you would be a user at your yeah. company um, that you're adminning for, but Rachel would not. So the information you saw in the spreadsheet, none of that would be users. It would all be contacts. And when you get into contact you'll be able to attach it to an account because that relationship is already um, established and available for you. You just have to tell Salesforce what account to attach it to. So there's a there's a linking field there and you're just going to put the account ID um, for whatever her company is. Right. So I think I'm, I'm, right. I'm, I'm yeah. still go missing out the export part that was, which you answered me well. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Absolutely. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Glad we were able to get some answers for you, though, though the presentation wasn't quite working. Uh, can we get some claps and emojis for our presenters today? Jaya or Jaya and Jonathan, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Rebecca for uh, some quick golden nuggets before we wrap up today. Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody did a really awesome job. So excited. Um, when you when you have questions, when you're not sure, when you're not really feeling like you're going to get right, definitely raise your hand and come up here because that is absolutely why we're here. Um, and you can do multiple of these sessions as well if you want to like get deeper with it. Um, in general, I would say do a doesn't make sense check. Check for duplicates. Check for formatting. Check that you're following all of the rules of the fields that are in Salesforce. Check that you have a container to put this in in Salesforce. Um, and if not, definitely talk through with your stakeholder what it should be and what the rules should be and how it's used. Um, but in general, I think that when we talk about data, it feels really heavy and analytical and to some extent it is, but I would say really approach this patiently and from a human centered business value centered perspective, and you'll have a much easier time with it. Um, you're not really trying to find a place for zeros and ones. You're trying to find a place to store information about your customer that's important to your business process um, and important to your relationships. So that's my two cents. Don't get too caught it, up. Yeah, that makes it so much more approachable. What it, What is the information about the humans behind those numbers? Awesome, awesome. Great golden nuggets. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, everybody. So thank you to everybody who participated today. And we'll see you hopefully on Thursday for another data analysis challenge. Bye, everybody.